Part Three, Chapter Seventeen and Eighteen of Democracy in America, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. Democracy in America, Volume Two, by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Part Three. Chapter 17. That the aspect of society in the United States is at once excited and monotonous. It would seem that nothing can be more adapted to stimulate and to feed curiosity than the aspect of the United States. Fortunes, opinions, and laws are there in ceaseless variation. It is as if immutable nature herself were mutable. Such are the changes worked upon her by the hand of man. Yet, in the end, the sight of this excited community becomes monotonous, and after having watched the moving pageant for a time, the spectator is tired of it. Amongst aristocratic nations every man is pretty nearly stationary in his own sphere, but men are astonishingly unlike each other. Their passions, their notions, their habits, and their tastes are essentially different. Nothing changes, but everything differs. In democracies, on the contrary, all men are alike, and do things pretty nearly alike. It is true that they are subject to great and frequent vicissitudes, but as the same events of good or adverse fortune are continually recurring, the name of the actors only is changed. The peace is always the same. The aspect of American society is animated, because men and things are always changing, but it is monotonous, because all these changes are alike. Men living in democratic ages have many passions, but most of their passions either end in the love of riches or proceed from it. The cause of this is not that their souls are narrower, but that the importance of money is really greater at such times. When all the members of a community are independent of or indifferent to each other, the cooperation of each of them can only be obtained by paying for it. This infinitely multiplies the purposes to which wealth may be applied, and increases its value. When the reverence which belonged to what is old has vanished, birth, condition, and profession no longer distinguish men, or scarcely distinguish them at all. Hardly anything but money remains to create strongly marked differences between them, and to raise some of them above the common level. The distinction originating in wealth is increased by the disappearance and diminution of all other distinctions. Amongst aristocratic nations, money only reaches to a few points on the vast circle of man's desires. In democracies, it seems to lead to all. The love of wealth is therefore to be traced, either as a principal or an accessory motive, at the bottom of all that the Americans do. This gives to all their passions a sort of family likeness, and soon renders the survey of them exceedingly wearisome. This perpetual recurrence of the same passion is monotonous. The peculiar methods by which this passion seeks its own gratification are no less so. In an orderly and constituted democracy like the United States, where men cannot enrich themselves by war, by public office, or by political confiscation, the love of wealth mainly drives them into business and manufactures. Although these pursuits often bring about great commotions and disasters, they cannot prosper without strictly regular habits and a long routine of petty uniform acts. The stronger the passion is, the more regular are these habits, and the more uniform are these acts. It may be said that it is the vehemence of their desires which makes the Americans so methodical. It perturbs their minds, but it disciplines their lives. The remark I here apply to America may indeed be addressed to almost all our contemporaries. Variety is disappearing from the human race. The same ways of acting, thinking, and feeling are to be met with all over the world. This is not only because nations work more upon each other and are more faithful in their mutual imitation, but as the men of each country relinquish more and more the peculiar opinions and feelings of a caste, a profession, or a family, they simultaneously arrive at something nearer to the constitution of man, which is everywhere the same. 
Thus they become more alike, even without having imitated each other. Like travellers scattered about some large wood, which is intersected by paths converging to one point, if all of them keep their eyes fixed upon that point and advance towards it, they insensibly draw nearer together, though they seek not, though they see not, though they know not each other and they will be surprised at length to find themselves all collected on the same spot. All the nations which take, not any particular man, but man himself, as the object of their researches and their imitations, are tending in the end to a similar state of society, like these travellers converging to the central plot of the forest. End of Part 3 Chapter 17 Part 3 Chapter 18 of honor in the United States and in democratic communities. It would seem that men employ two very distinct methods in the public estimation of the actions of their fellow men. At one time they judge them by those simple notions of right and wrong which are diffused all over the world. At another they refer their decision to a very few special notions which belong exclusively to some particular age and country. Footnote. The word honor is not always used in the same sense either in French or English. 1. It first signifies the dignity, glory, or reverence which a man receives from his kind, and in this sense a man is said to acquire honor. 2. Honor signifies the aggregate of those rules by the assistance of which this dignity, glory, or reverence is obtained. Thus we say that a man has always strictly obeyed the laws of honor, or a man has violated his honor. In this chapter the word is always used in the latter sense. End of footnote. It often happens that these two rules differ. They sometimes conflict. But they are never either entirely identified or entirely annulled by one another. Honor, at the periods of its greatest power, sways the will more than the belief of men and even whilst they yield without hesitation and without a murmur to its dictates they feel notwithstanding by a dim but mighty instinct the existence of a more general more ancient and more holy law which they sometimes disobey although they ceased not to acknowledge it some actions have been held to be at the same time virtuous and dishonourable a refusal to fight a duel is a case in point I think these peculiarities may be otherwise explained than by the mere caprices of certain individuals and nations, as has hitherto been the customary mode of reasoning on the subject. Mankind is subject to general and lasting wants, that have engendered moral laws, to the neglect of which men have ever and in all places attached the notion of censure and shame. To infringe them was to do ill. To do well was to conform to them. Within the bosom of this vast association of the human race, lesser associations have been formed which are called nations, and amidst these nations further subdivisions have assumed the names of classes or castes. Each of these associations forms, as it were, a separate species of the human race, and though it has no essential difference from the mass of mankind, to a certain extent it stands apart and has certain wants peculiar to itself. To these special wants must be attributed the modifications which affect in various degrees and in different countries the mode of considering human actions, and the estimate which ought to be formed of them. It is the general and permanent interest of mankind that men should not kill each other, but it may happen to be the peculiar and temporary interest of a people or a class to justify or even to honor homicide. Honor is simply that peculiar rule, founded upon a peculiar state of society, by the application of which a people or a class allot praise or blame. Nothing is more unproductive to the mind than an abstract idea. I therefore hasten to call in the aid of facts and examples to illustrate my meaning. I select the most extraordinary kind of honor which was ever known in the world, and that which we are best acquainted with, viz., aristocratic honor springing out of a feudal society. I shall explain it by means of the principle already laid down, and I shall explain the principle by means of the illustration. 
I am not here led to inquire when and how the aristocracy of the Middle Ages came into existence, why it was so deeply severed from the remainder of the nation, or what founded and consolidated its power. I take its existence as an established fact, and I am endeavoring to account for the peculiar view which it took of the greater part of human actions. The first thing that strikes me is that in the feudal world actions were not always praised or blamed with reference to their intrinsic worth, but that they were sometimes appreciated exclusively with reference to the person who was the actor or the object of them, which is repugnant to the general conscience of mankind. Thus some of the actions which were indifferent on the part of a man in humble life dishonored a noble others changed their whole character according as the person aggrieved by them belonged or did not belong to the aristocracy when these different notions first arose the nobility formed a distinct body amidst the people which it commanded from the inaccessible heights where it was ensconced to maintain this peculiar position which constituted its strength it not only required political privileges but it required a standard of right and wrong for its own special use. That some particular virtue or vice belonged to the nobility rather than to the humble classes, that certain actions were guiltless when they affected the villain, which were criminal when they touched the noble, these were often arbitrary matters. But that honor or shame should be attached to a man's actions according to his condition was a result of the internal constitution of an aristocratic community. This has been actually the case in all the countries which have had an aristocracy. As long as a trace of the principle remains, these peculiarities will still exist. To debauch a woman of color scarcely injures the reputation of an American. To marry her dishonors him. In some cases feudal honor enjoined revenge, and stigmatized the forgiveness of insults. In others it imperiously commanded men to conquer their own passions, and imposed forgetfulness of self. It did not make humanity or kindness its law, but it extolled generosity. It set more store on liberality than on benevolence. It allowed men to enrich themselves by gambling or by war, but not by labor. It preferred great crimes to small earnings. Cupidity was less distasteful to it than avarice. Violence it often sanctioned, but cunning and treachery it invariably reprobated as contemptible. These fantastical notions did not proceed exclusively from the caprices of those who entertained them. A class which has succeeded in placing itself at the head of, and above all others, and which makes perpetual exertions to maintain this lofty position, must especially honor those virtues which are conspicuous for their dignity and splendor, and which may be easily combined with pride and the love of power. Such men would not hesitate to invert the natural order of the conscience in order to give those virtues precedence before all others. It may even be conceived that some of the more bold and brilliant vices would readily be set above the quiet, unpretending virtues. The very existence of such a class in society renders these things unavoidable. The nobles of the Middle Ages placed military courage foremost amongst virtues, and in lieu of many of them. This was again a peculiar opinion which arose necessarily from the peculiarity of the state of society. Feudal aristocracy existed by war and for war. Its power had been founded by arms, and by arms that power was maintained. It therefore required nothing more than military courage, and that quality was naturally exalted above all others. Whatever denoted it, even at the expense of reason and humanity, was therefore approved and frequently enjoined by the manners of the time. Such was the main principle. The caprice of man was only to be traced in minuter details. That a man should regard a tap on the cheek as an unbearable insult, and should be obliged to kill in single combat the person who struck him thus lightly, is an arbitrary rule. But that a noble could not tranquilly receive an insult, and was dishonored if he allowed himself to take a blow without fighting, were direct consequences of the fundamental principles and the wants of military aristocracy. Thus it was true, to a certain extent, to assert that the laws of honor were capricious. But these caprices of honor 
were always confined within certain necessary limits. The peculiar rule, which was called honor by our forefathers, is so far from being an arbitrary law in my eyes that I would readily engage to ascribe its most incoherent and fantastical injunctions to a small number of fixed and invariable wants inherent in feudal society. If I were to trace the notion of feudal honor into the domain of politics, I should not find it more difficult to explain its dictates. The state of society and the political institutions of the Middle Ages were such that the supreme power of the nation never governed the community directly. The power did not exist in the eyes of the people. Every man looked up to a certain individual whom he was bound to obey. By that intermediate personage he was connected with all the others. Thus in feudal society the whole system of the commonwealth rested upon the sentiment of fidelity to the person of the Lord. To destroy that sentiment was to open the sluices of anarchy. Fidelity to a political superior was, moreover, a sentiment of which all the members of the aristocracy had constant opportunities of estimating the importance. For every one of them was a vassal, as well as a lord, and had to command as well as to obey. To remain faithful to the lord, to sacrifice oneself for him if called upon, to share his good or evil fortunes, to stand by him in his undertakings, whatever they might be, such were the first injunctions of feudal honor in relation to the political institutions of those times. The treachery of a vassal was branded with extraordinary severity by public opinion, and a name of peculiar infamy was invented for the offense which was called felony. On the contrary, few traces are to be found in the Middle Ages of the passion which constituted the life of the nations of antiquity. I mean patriotism. The word itself is not a very ancient date in the language. Footnote. Even the word patrie was not used by the French writers until the sixteenth century. End of footnote. Feudal institutions concealed the country at large from men's sight, and rendered the love of it less necessary. The nation was forgotten in the passions which attached men to persons. Hence it was no part of the strict law of feudal honor to remain faithful to one's country. Not indeed that the love of their country did not exist in the hearts of our forefathers, but it constituted a dim and feeble instinct, which has grown more clear and strong in proportion as aristocratic classes have been abolished, and the supreme power of the nation centralized. This may be clearly seen from the contrary judgments which European nations have passed upon the various events of their histories, according to the generations by which such judgments have been formed. The circumstance which most dishonored the Constable de Bourbon in the eyes of his contemporaries was that he bore arms against his king. That which most dishonors him in our eyes is that he made war against his country. We brand him as deeply as our forefathers did, but for different reasons. I have chosen the honor of feudal times by way of illustration of my meaning, because its characteristics are more distinctly marked and more familiar to us than those of any other period. But I might have taken an example elsewhere, and I should have reached the same conclusion by a different road. Although we are less perfectly acquainted with the Romans than with our own ancestors, yet we know that certain peculiar notions of glory and disgrace obtained amongst them, which were not solely derived from the general principles of right and wrong. Many human actions were judged differently, according as they affected a Roman citizen or a stranger, a free man or a slave. Certain vices were blazoned abroad, certain virtues were extolled above all others. In that age, says Plutarch in the life of Coriolanus, martial prowess was more honored and prized in Rome than all the other virtues, insomuch that it was called virtus, the name of virtue itself, by applying the name of the kind to this particular species, so that virtue in Latin was as much as to say valor. Can anyone fail to recognize the peculiar want of that singular community which was formed for the conquest of the world? any nation would furnish us with similar grounds of observation, for, as I have already remarked, whenever men collect together as a distinct community, the notion of honor instantly grows up amongst them, that is to say, a system of opinions peculiar to themselves as to what is blamable or commendable, 
and these peculiar rules always originate in the special habits and special interests of the community. This is applicable to a certain extent to democratic communities as well as to others, as we shall now proceed to prove by the example of the Americans. Footnote. I speak here of the Americans inhabiting those states where slavery does not exist. They alone can be said to present a complete picture of democratic society. End of footnote. Some loose notions of the old aristocratic honor of Europe are still to be found scattered amongst the opinions of the Americans. But these traditional opinions are few in number. They have but little root in the country, and but little power. They are like a religion which has still some temples left standing, though men have ceased to believe in it. But amidst these half-obliterated notions of exotic honor, some new opinions have sprung up which constitute what may be termed in our days American honor. I have shown how the Americans are constantly driven to engage in commerce and industry. Their origin, their social condition, their political institutions, and even the spot they inhabit, urge them irresistibly in this direction. Their present condition is, then, that of an almost exclusively manufacturing and commercial association, placed in the midst of a new and boundless country, which their principal object is to explore for purposes of profit. This is the characteristic which most peculiarly distinguishes the American people from all others at the present time all those quiet virtues which tend to give a regular movement to the community and to encourage business will therefore be held in particular honor by that people and to neglect those virtues will be to incur public contempt all the more turbulent virtues which often dazzle but more frequently disturb society will on the contrary occupy a subordinate rank in the estimation of this same people they may be neglected without forfeiting the esteem of the community to acquire them would perhaps be to run a risk of losing it. The Americans make a no less arbitrary classification of men's vices. There are certain propensities which appear censurable to the general reason and the universal conscience of mankind, but which happen to agree with the peculiar and temporary wants of the American community. These propensities are lightly reproved, sometimes even encouraged. For instance, the love of wealth and the secondary propensities connected with it may be more particularly cited. To clear, to till, and to transform the vast uninhabited continent which is his domain, the American requires the daily support of an energetic passion. That passion can only be the love of wealth. The passion for wealth is therefore not reprobated in America, and provided it does not go beyond the bounds assigned to it for public security, it is held in honor. The American lauds as noble and praiseworthy ambition what our own forefathers in the Middle Ages stigmatized as servile cupidity, such as he treats as a blind and barbarous frenzy that ardor of conquest and martial temper which bore them to battle. In the United States, fortunes are lost and regained without difficulty. The country is boundless and its resources inexhaustible. The people have all the wants and cravings of a grown creature, and whatever be their efforts, they are always surrounded by more than they can appropriate. It is not the ruin of a few individuals which may be soon repaired, but the inactivity and sloth of the community at large which would be fatal to such a people. Boldness of enterprise is the foremost cause of its rapid progress, its strength, and its greatness. Commercial business is there like a vast lottery, by which a small number of men continually lose, but the state is always a gainer. Such a people ought therefore to encourage and do honor to boldness and commercial speculations. But any bold speculation risks the fortune of the speculator and of all those who put their trust in him. The Americans, who make a virtue of commercial temerity, have no right in any case to brand with disgrace those who practice it. Hence arises the strange indulgence which is shown to bankrupts in the United States. Their honor does not suffer by such an accident. In this respect the Americans differ, not only from the nations of Europe, but from all the commercial nations of our time, and accordingly they resemble none of them in their position or their wants. 
In America, all those vices which tend to impair the purity of morals and to destroy the conjugal tie are treated with a degree of severity which is unknown in the rest of the world. At first sight, this seems strangely at variance with the tolerance shown there on other subjects, and one is surprised to meet with a morality so relaxed and so austere amongst the self-same people. But these things are less incoherent than they may seem to be. Public opinion in the United States very gently represses that love of wealth which promotes the commercial greatness and the prosperity of the nation, and it especially condemns that laxity of morals which diverts the human mind from the pursuit of well-being and disturbs the internal order of domestic life which is so necessary to success in business. To earn the esteem of their countrymen, the Americans are therefore constrained to adapt themselves to orderly habits, and it may be said in this sense that they make it a matter of honor to live chastely. On one point American honor accords with the notions of honor acknowledged in Europe. It places courage as the highest virtue, and treats it as the greatest of the moral necessities of man. But the notion of courage itself assumes a different aspect. In the United States martial valor is but little prized. The courage which is best known and most esteemed is that which emboldens men to brave the dangers of the ocean in order to arrive earlier in port, to support the privations of the wilderness without complaint, and solitude more cruel than privations, the courage which renders them almost insensible to the loss of a fortune laboriously acquired, and instantly prompts to fresh exertions to make another. Courage of this kind is peculiarly necessary to the maintenance and prosperity of the American communities, and it is held by them in peculiar honor and estimation. To betray a want of it is to incur certain disgrace. I have yet another characteristic point which may serve to place the idea of this chapter in stronger relief. In a democratic society like that of the United States, where fortunes are scanty and insecure, everybody works, and work opens a way to everything. This has changed the point of honor quite round, and has turned it against idleness. I have sometimes met in America with young men of wealth, personally disinclined to all laborious exertion, but who had been compelled to embrace a profession. Their disposition and their fortune allowed them to remain without employment. Public opinion forbade it, too imperiously to be disobeyed. In the European countries, on the contrary, where aristocracy is still struggling with the flood which overwhelms it, I have often seen men, constantly spurred on by their wants and desires, remain in idleness in order not to lose the esteem of their equals, and I have known them submit to ennui and privations rather than to work. No one can fail to perceive that these opposite obligations are two different rules of conduct, both, nevertheless, originating in the notion of honor. What our forefathers designated as honor absolutely was in reality only one of its forms. They gave a generic name to what was only a species. Honor, therefore, is to be found in democratic as well as in aristocratic ages, but it will not be difficult to show that it assumes a different aspect in the former. Not only are its injunctions different, but we shall shortly see that they are less numerous, less precise, and that its dictates are less rigorously obeyed. The position of a caste is always much more peculiar than that of a people. Nothing is so much out of the way of the world as a small community invariably composed of the same families, as was, for instance, the aristocracy of the Middle Ages, whose object is to concentrate and to retain, exclusively and hereditarily, education, wealth, and power amongst its own members. But the more out of the way the position of a community happens to be, the more numerous are its special wants, and the more extensive are its notions of honor corresponding to those wants. The rules of honor will therefore always be less numerous amongst a people not divided into castes than among any other. If ever any nations are constituted in which it may even be difficult to find any peculiar classes of society, the notion of honor will be confined to a small number of precepts, which will be more and more in accordance with the moral laws adopted by the mass of mankind. 
thus the laws of honor will be less peculiar and less multifarious amongst a democratic people than in an aristocracy they will also be more obscure and this is a necessary consequence of what goes before for as the distinguishing marks of honor are less numerous and less peculiar it must often be difficult to distinguish them to this other reasons may be added amongst the aristocratic nations of the middle ages generation succeeded generation in vain each family was like a never dying ever stationary man and the state of opinions was hardly more changeable than that of conditions every one then had always the same objects before his eyes which he contemplated from the same point his eyes gradually detected the smallest details and his discernment could not fail to become in the end clear and accurate thus not only had the men of feudal times very extraordinary opinions in matters of honor but each of those opinions was present to their minds under a clear and precise form this can never be the case in america where all men are in constant motion and where society transformed daily by its own operations changes its opinions together with its wants in such a country men have glimpses of the rules of honor but they have seldom time to fix attention upon them but even if society were motionless it would still be difficult to determine the meaning which ought to be attached to the word honor in the middle ages as each class had its own honor the same opinion was never received at the same time by a large number of men and this rendered it possible to give it a determined and accurate form which was the more easy as all those by whom it was received having a perfectly identical and most peculiar position were naturally disposed to agree upon the points of a law which was made for themselves alone thus the code of honor became a complete and detailed system in which everything was anticipated and provided for beforehand and a fixed and always palpable standard was applied to human actions amongst a democratic nation like the americans in which ranks are identified and the whole of society forms one single mass composed of elements which are all analogous though not entirely similar it is impossible ever to agree beforehand on what shall or shall not be allowed by the laws of honor amongst that people indeed some national wants do exist which give rise to opinions common to the whole nation on points of honor but these opinions never occur at the same time in the same manner or with the same intensity to the minds of the whole community the law of honor exists but it has no organs to promulgate it the confusion is far greater still in a democratic country like france where the different classes of which the former fabric of society was composed being brought together but not yet mingled import day by day into each other's circles various and sometimes conflicting notions of honor where every man at his own will and pleasure forsakes one portion of his forefathers creed and retains another so that amidst so many arbitrary measures no common rule can ever be established and it is almost impossible to predict which actions will be held in honor and which will be thought disgraceful such times are wretched but they are of short duration as honor amongst democratic nations is imperfectly defined its influence is of course less powerful for it is difficult to apply with certainty and firmness a law which is not distinctly known public opinion the natural and supreme interpreter of the laws of honor not clearly discerning to which side censure or approval ought to lean can only pronounce a hesitating judgment sometimes the opinion of the public may contradict itself more frequently it does not act and lets things pass the weakness of the sense of honor in democracies also arises from several other causes in aristocratic countries the same notions of honor are always entertained by only a few persons always limited in number often separated from the rest of their fellow citizens honor is easily mingled and identified in their minds with the idea of all that distinguishes their own position it appears to them as the chief characteristic of their own rank they apply its different rules with all the warmth of personal interest and they feel if i may use the expression 
a passion for complying with its dictates. This truth is extremely obvious in the old black-letter law books on the subject of trial by battle. The nobles, in their disputes, were bound to use the lance and sword, whereas the villains used only sticks amongst themselves. Inasmuch as, to use the words of the old books, villains have no honor. This did not mean, as it may be imagined at the present day, that these people were contemptible, but simply that their actions were not to be judged by the same rules which were applied to the actions of the aristocracy. It is surprising at first sight that when the sense of honor is most predominant, its injunctions are usually most strange, so that the further it is removed from common reason, the better it is obeyed. Whence it has sometimes been inferred that the laws of honor were strengthened by their own extravagance. The two things, indeed, originate from the same source, but the one is not derived from the other. Honor becomes fantastical in proportion to the peculiarity of the wants which it denotes, and the paucity of the men by whom those wants are felt, and it is because it denotes wants of this kind that its influence is great. Thus the notion of honor is not the stranger for being fantastical, but it is fantastical and strong from the selfsame cause. Further, amongst aristocratic nations, each rank is different, but all ranks are fixed. Every man occupies a place in his own sphere which he cannot relinquish, and he lives there amidst other men who are bound by the same ties. Amongst these nations no man can either hope or fear to escape being seen. No man is placed so low but that he has a stage of his own, and none can avoid censure or applause by this obscurity. In democratic states, on the contrary, where all the members of the community are mingled in the same crowd and in constant agitation, public opinion has no hold on men. They disappear at every instant and elude its power. Consequently, the dictates of honor will be there less imperious and less stringent, for honor acts solely for the public eye differing in this respect from mere virtue, which lives upon itself contented and with its own approval. If the reader has distinctly apprehended all that goes before, he will understand that there is a close and necessary relation between the inequality of social conditions and what has here been styled honor, a relation which, if I am not mistaken, had not before been clearly pointed out. I shall therefore make one more attempt to illustrate it satisfactorily. Suppose a nation stands apart from the rest of mankind, independently of certain general wants inherent in the human race. It will also have wants and interests peculiar to itself. Certain opinions of censure or approbation forthwith arise in the community, which are peculiar to itself, and which are styled honor by the members of that community. Now, suppose that in the same nation a caste arises, which in its turn stands apart from all the other classes, and contracts certain peculiar wants, which give rise, in their turn, to special opinions. The honor of this caste, composed of a medley of the peculiar notions of the nation, and the still more peculiar notions of the caste, will be as remote as it is possible to conceive from the simple and general opinions of men. Having reached this extreme point of the argument, I now return. When ranks are commingled and privileges abolished, the men of whom a nation is composed being once more equal and alike, their interests and wants become identical, and all the peculiar notions which each caste styled honor successively disappear. The notion of honor no longer proceeds from any other source than the wants peculiar to the nation at large and it denotes the individual character of that nation to the world. Lastly, if it be allowable to suppose that all the races of mankind should be commingled, and that all the peoples of the earth should ultimately come to have the same interests, the same wants, undistinguished from each other by any characteristic peculiarities, no conventional value whatever would then be attached to men's actions. They would all be regarded by all in the same light, the general necessities of mankind, revealed by conscience to every man, would become the common standard. 
the simple and general notions of right and wrong only would then be recognized in the world, to which, by a natural and necessary tie, the idea of censure or approbation would be attached. Thus, to comprise all my meaning in a single proposition, the dissimilarities and inequalities of men give rise to the notion of honor that notion is weakened in proportion as these differences are obliterated and with them it would disappear and of part three chapter eighteen recording by john leader bloomington illinois